Hello, New York. Oh my God, I'm so nervous right now. Anyway, I'm Saisa Crispacani. I'm a Filipina photographer from the Philippines, but I'm based in Hong Kong. I'm a street and documentary photographer, and I'm here because of Fujifilm. Uh, today, I want to talk about, first, I want to make myself relevant, like, you know, so people don't wonder, like, why is this brown girl in front of us right now trying to uh, talk about photography? I started photography in 2009. I started shooting street photography, and I transitioned to documentary photography in 2014. So in the street photography, I go out every day. I do it daily, and um, I do documentary works in a long-form long project. So I want to start with, oh, how do you do this? Street photography as a foundation. I call it as a foundation because if you do street photography without um, the newsworthiness, without the actors or actresses in your frame or make interest, uninteresting moments in life interesting, it will be easier for you to transition to other types of genres because you've been doing it, you know, street photography is free so you can do it every day and I think it's the best genre for you to practice your photography. So street photography as a foundation will teach you how to see natural lights. It will also teach you how to compose. It will teach you how to create decisive moments. So my talk is about decisive moments today. It's a, bit, it's a little bit like a big topic. You know, like an hour talking about it will not be enough. But I'll try to cover as many as bases. So I have a series called Love and Poetry. And this is one of the images I took in New York in MoMA. So one of the things that I do in street photography is I create photo series out of the things that I photograph. I connect these images that I take from different cities around the globe and make it as a photo series. What makes a photograph? Form and content and intent. Form and content is the way you compose your images. It's the way how you use light, how you use texture, gesture, how do you present your image visually? This form and content are the things that are happening within your frame. Intent is the why behind it. So what is your intent when you took that photo? I always encourage people who attend my workshop to get out, get out for, uh, go out and photograph and then ask them to explain their images. Like, why did you press the shutter? It's good to know the whys so that the how will be easier. So um, I'm going to discuss about, so these are photographs from Hong Kong. Most of my works are in black and white, but I actually shoot in color. So these are some of the works in Hong Kong, streets of Hong Kong. This is Japan. This is Philippines. So in street photography, you need to at least know the basics of photography and the whys behind it. I really suggest reading the manual. I think this is the first step before you even you know, call yourself a photographer. <laughs> the first thing that you should do is read the manual because you need to learn how to use the equipment so that it will become a tool, something that will only help you take the photographs. Because in photography, there are, you know, I consider it as like there's the viewer, the subject, and you. But you need to learn the whys behind it. So I will uh, discuss and next, you know, some few techniques that I use in street photography. So these are the things. I use close-up shot a lot because details will make or break a photo. So if you, you know, the world is big and sometimes we tend to look at the bigger picture all the time, but actually it's the small details that can make or break it. For example, this photo of a close-up photo of a refugee in Hong Kong, it doesn't look like it's it's a refugee, it's just a hand with um, scratches, and it, it have a sense of place, but it's a detail. In creating narratives, I'm always trying to remind myself that to take details because it's important in creating a narrative. The next one is wide shot, we all do this. Wide shot is good for layering in street photography, and in wide shots, you get a sense of place, a gesture, a subject, what is happening within the frame. And the next one is the medium shot, which is a little bit closer than the wide shot. 
I'm not a very technical person, so I'm not going to speak like, you know, in technical terms. I'm speaking more into layman's terms. So the next one that you do is change the angles when you take photographs. Because when you change the angles when you take photos, it makes your photos interesting. Like, for example, when you take a photo from below, rather than just taking photos, everything from this, you can try to cr crouch down. I mean, photography is a verb. Use your feet, you know, use your body. So you can also try, when you're taking portraits, you can also try from above to give it a little bit more of dynamic. The next one that I'm very OC with is symmetry or balance. Like, I try my photos to be symmetrical because when, uh, I think, a meta I can explain it this way. When you're reading a book, you read it from this to this. You, you read it in a way that is balanced. You don't read it like this. Like, can you see me, like what I'm trying to do? So you read it in a way that is balanced. So symmetry and balance is good because it, it helps your viewers look at your photos in a way that they, it won't make them dizzy. This is an example of a photo that is perfectly symmetrical. I'm talking about elements of designs that painters usually use in their artwork. So actually, you can use the elements of design when you're out and taking photographs. This is another example of a very balanced image. Next one is lights and shadows. I think this is one of the things that are really important when you're practicing photography because, well, photography is writing with light, right? So shadows are also important to give you a more dynamic image. You should use it to your advantage. For example, this photo of, um, you can see that there's a feet. The light will attract you, but then the shadows makes it deeper. This is another one, and this one, and this one. This is in Japan, by the way. It's in a mosque in Japan. This is in Hong Kong. Lights, when you learn to play with lights and shadows, it makes your photo three-dimensional instead of being two-dimensional. No matter how good your content is, no matter how interesting it was, the things that are happening within the frame, if your light is flat, then it won't be that visually attractive. For example, this photo of a guy just walking. It's, a, it's boring, right? Like, it's just a guy walking. Like, what am I trying to say within this photograph? Nothing. But because of the, arra because of the arrangement of light and shadows, it looks a little bit interesting. I hope you agree with me when I say it's interesting. So, Sometimes boring things that are happening around you can be really interesting if you learn how to use light and shadow. So the next one is this. I always check the weather when I go out and photograph. Weather is your friend. Rain is your friend. I mean, don't be scared to go out. I know cameras are expensive, but well, you should go out and take photos when it's raining because the weather, especially the rain, will give that texture on your photographs. The next one is layering. Layering is a little bit complicated in street photography. So in street photography, there are a lots of templates that street photographers use. So I'm just using the simple ones in layering because sometimes it, there's a lot into it that it makes it harder to do. But actually, this is the most interesting um, challenge that you can do for street photography. So in street photography, you can actually challenge yourself with these different techniques. Like for today, I'm going to go out. I'm going to give myself an assignment. I'm just going to shoot layering. And the next day, I'm just going to shoot boring photos, but I'm going to practice lights and shadows. So you can do that in street photography because it's free. You don't need to pay money to go out and photograph. You just grab your camera, you go out, and there's always something happening on your neighborhood. It, sometimes the best projects are the one that is happening near you. You know, I, it's good to go to different places, like you can go and travel, but sometimes you just need to get out of the house, watch your neighbors, watch whatever is happening, and take photographs, and that's a good way to practice. So in layering, there are three things that I usually consider. It's foreground, middle ground, background. Like way back when we watched the telly, it's, it's actually black and white. 
compared to today, which is in HD, which one is better? Is the black and white or the HD? So in, in photography, layering will help you create a, an image that has three dimensions. For example, this image of um, in the beach in the Philippines, if you look at it, the, the, the kid, she's alive by the way, she's not dead. So she's playing dead, is the foreground, the father is the middle ground, and the woman is the background. Because of the layers of foreground, middle ground, background, my, your, the, your, the viewer's eye will go from the, the, will start from the kid to the father and to the woman, and then it will just go around. So you want your viewers to look at your image in a three-dimensional way. This one is, I call it your photo should, the frame should have an exit and an entrance. Okay, I don't have a mic, but um, if you look at this image, this side is the entrance. Like how I compose it, everything, they're all connected with each other. But if you look at the frame, this side is the entrance and it will exit this way. So sometimes a frame is good to look at when there's an entrance and there's an exit. So these little techniques in street photography can be done every day. The next one is shapes. I mean, look at where we are now. It's really beautiful. There's beautiful light, beautiful shapes all around us. You should use it to make your photos dynamic. I mean, they created this for us, right? So why not use it to make art? So one thing that I usually use is the shapes that architects have, you know, the buildings everywhere. So for example, our triangles, frames, frame within a frames. This photo in Hong Kong, there's a sense of place. It's very obvious that it's a restaurant because of the outside. You know, like you can see pots, you can see uh, plates, but then because of that little frame with in, inside the frame, that square shape that framed the, the chef inside, it makes it look, it makes, it looks like it's dynamic. Your eyes are drawn to it, to that guy, because of that little square at the middle. And the next one is this, frame within a frame. I usually shoot at night time, by the way, because in night, during darkness, personalities change. You'll see things that you don't usually at, see at daytime. Like, a, for example, a banker at daytime can be someone who's drunk and rolling on the street at the nighttime. And these are interesting photos. So for example, this is a photo that I took at midnight. This is a tram driver in Hong Kong. You don't usually see that at daytime because there's so much happening at daytime, but at nighttime, it looks isolated. The next one is this. This is also another night shoot where I use the circles to frame the sense of place that you can see the ducks, the chickens, and then you can see the person, the chef inside it. So sometimes you just need to look around. You don't need to go out every day with a camera, but sometimes you just need to sit around and observe your surroundings. That's one thing that street photography can actually um, help you with. It's about looking around, observing whatever's happening around you. It makes you also a better person because if you're not busy looking at your phone and you're looking around people, maybe, you know, it makes you a better person. It just makes me a better person when I go out and just sit down and look at people because that's how you learn, you know? That's how it kind of humanizes you in some ways. So the next one is triangle. Like if you look at the image, there's a lot of triangle on it. Like the, the way that the boy's hands are framed and then there's two kids on his back and then the triangles on the back. So sometimes when you put all these shapes in a, in a frame, it makes the photo interesting. The next one is texture, which is um, really good in black and white. You know, I usually use this in uh, my black and white photos. These te techniques are figure to ground, contrast, and light. I've been mentioning about light since a while ago because I think it's really important that us photographers learn about lights, especially natural lights. So this is an example of a very good textured photo. It's during, it, I think I took this last March during the snowstorm. 
So I went out, again, wet, bad weather is your friend. I mean, you can't get that during summer, yeah? So you can only get it during when it, it's like a typhoon. So I went out during the snowstorm and took some photos of New Yorkers. And because it's a snowstorm, it makes it look interesting. I rarely use flash, but this time I was using flash because it helps me get this texture. The next one is this. This is actually a photo of a child labor victim in Singapore. Sometimes you, if you go to documentary photography, there are, pro, there are stories that are very sensitive and you should not show their faces because their cases are sensitive and using textures, lights, shadows will help you create an image that is still interesting, visually interesting, but then have meaning behind it. So an empty brain is a blind eye. Uh, all my photographs is the collect is my collect is the collective um, it's my collective experiences. These are the things that I've read. These are the things that I've watched. These are the things that I've seen. So when you don't put anything, I suggest. I'm sorry if my English is not that good. <laughs> so I came from Asia. I, I speak five languages. So now my brain is like shooting. I don't, we, I don't know which one to speak. So. An empty brain is a blind eye. I suggest that because when you read something, y your brain will process that, and when you go out, you'll see these things that you read. You'll see these things that you watch. I often watch movies on my downtime. I often read books because it makes my imagination crazy. So when you read a lot of books, when you watch a lot of movies, when you look at other people's work, somehow, your imagination is active. And when your imagination is active, you can go out and take these photos. So um, this is a portrait of a woman in Hong Kong who's uh, also a, an, abu an abuse migrant worker in Hong Kong. You can use the things that you've learned in street photography in taking portraits as well. This is natural lights. So there, uh, I did not use any flash, but then because I'm, uh, I was trained to look at, at natural lights on the street, it looks more dynamic than just a portrait. So after reading everything about you know, street photography, about techniques, about reading your manual, you need to go out. You need to move. You need to use it. Photography is a verb because it's an action. No matter how many things you, you read about photography, if you don't go out and practice and do it, it will not be as effective as just doing both. Like for example, if you r read your manual, but do not practice on your camera about your man what you whatever you read on your manual, then you'll never learn how to use your camera. So when you go out, when you practice all these techniques that you've read on the internet, on the books, or whatever thing that you've learned from, photography will become a reflex. Because you're doing it every day, that you're used to it, so it's now a reflex with you. Like, it doesn't matter anymore that, you know, it will become like a part of your hand. Like for example, uh, right now I have a camera on my hand because I'm supposed to show you that I'm a blind shooter. Anyway, let's talk about that blind shooting. I don't usually use the viewfinder on street photography. I use this camera, Fujifilm X-Pro2, and I just go around and photograph people because I train both of my eyes to see rather than a single one. And when you're shooting street photography, sometimes when you put it here, people will notice. But if you shoot it like this, they won't notice. Because they, didn't, they don't know, especially nowadays when everyone is doing selfie, everyone is just very aware of their surroundings. Once you do this, the moment will disappear because they will notice you. So what I do is I practice, I go out every day with one lens, one camera, I go out and shoot daily. And because of that, I was able to learn the, the focal distance, the distance of me and my subject. So without even, doing this, I'm already shooting. So blind shooting is, I don't know, a lot of people do not um, suggest it, but for me as a street photographer, it's one thing that helped me create more dynamic images. Like for, for this, it, it helps me 
get those decisive moments because the people I'm photographing do not notice me. So I'm a ninja, basically. So when I'm doing street photography, I'm a ninja. So the next one is this. This is a rally in Hong Kong. This is Occupy Hong Kong. I just took this like this. I did not use this. So another thing is curate and critique your own images. You should be your biggest fan, but also you should be your, you, your biggest critique. So this is an example of a set of images that I took. I was just sitting down. Uh, this is actually my family in the Philippines. I'm doing a book. So I was just sitting down and watching them, and I'm taking photos. But then some of it are stronger than the other one, but I need to kill one, two, three, four, five, six of them and only present one. People won't judge you on the things that you don't show them, so might as well show them your best images, right? So if you look at my Instagram, this is shameless plugging. Anyway, if you look at my Instagram, I usually curate my images. It doesn't mean that every photo that I took are good photos. Maybe out of five, there's only one that is good enough. So when you curate and critique your own images, that's only the things that people will see. And oh, the reason why you need to cri critique your own images is you learn. Like if you made a mistake in taking this photo today, you ask yourself, so what's wrong? What did I do wrong? And maybe the next time, you'll know how to do it better. So in photography, especially with the technology nowadays, we're not using film, we're all using digital. Take advantage of that where you can actually you know, shoot a lot and then pick the, the images that you want to show. And as you go, as you grow within this craft, you will learn to shoot, with, think before you shoot. So I have this technique, I was just talking about it a while ago on the podcast, about shooting without a camera like blinking your eye when you see a, a photo, like go out on a, a coffee shop, sit down, and if, if you see a photo or a scene that is good to shoot, blink your eye in some ways, or you can even do the sound if you want to, like, you know, <laughs> the sound of the camera. The reason is because you're teaching your eyes how to see. So when you already taken that, you, when you put it in your, there's science behind it. I'm not a scientist, I'm not a doctor. I cannot explain it, but my friend, a neurologist, was, sent me all this link about you know, the correlation of teaching yourself how to do things. So that's one technique that I do most times. I go out, I don't use my camera. If I see a scene, I blink it so I retain the memory in my head. So the next time that I'll see that scene with the camera, the camera will become just a tool. And, um, so I was talking about street photography, but actually most, most times I'm a documentary photographer. So in documentary photography, I'm a storyteller. In street photography, I am a hunter. So there's two big differences. I'm a hunter because I go out, I take photos of you, of you, of you. I don't even bother to ask who you are. I move on. I do it for personal gains. Meanwhile, in documentary photography, I'm a storyteller because I, cre I tell stories of other people. I create all these narratives. I, I go out in different countries and do stories, and sometimes it takes longer time than street photography. I want to show you a, a, my work that I'm doing right now. It will be out on November. So this is a, uh, five years. I've done this documentary works in five years, and finally it's ready to come out on November 18. So, okay. What if oh, there you go. one of them is my mother? What if my mother has to work abroad in such you know shit job? They're exclu excluded from the minimum wage. They earn such little money, and you know there are regulations not allowing them to live outside of the employer's house. You know, which traps them 24 hours in, 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 in the workplace. And Hong Kong owes these, uh, the migrants community a lot. Um, these uh, people who have been contributing for our society a lot, but we never acknowledge them. Uh, we often uh, mistreat them. We've never done enough for them. They have done a lot for us, but we've never done enough for them. The migrant community has always been very you know generous welcoming 
even hospita hospitable. These people are very, actually very interesting. They have different cultures, different languages, and there are a lot we can learn from them. Like if if my if I, if if my mother has to work abroad just for that little wage, I would be very sad. In general, our society can be more, you know, empathetic. Like, just try to imagine if you're one of them or if you are son and sons and daughters of these ladies, what would you feel like? Uh, education is very important. You know, we, we can't just uh, ignore their needs and we can't just live like, uh, you know, people from two different worlds. We can, we can definitely be harmonious among each other. It only takes just a, one, two steps for us. So in terms of uh, uh, economy, in terms of labor force and everything, Hong Kong can't live without uh, the migrants. We need the migrants. So I, I, I can't really imagine Hong Kong without these domestic workers. You know, our economy would collapse. So um, that's We Are Like Air, and uh, I don't know if I'm, not, I'm allowed to plug it. We're doing a public art in New York this June, so look out for different spaces about this project. All right, let's give a warm applause. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. Thank you so much for Pleasure. having me, people.